कृषिर्धन्य कृषिर्मेध्य जनुत नाम जीवनम कृषि है मीन्स एग्रीकल्चर प्रोवाइड्स वेल्थ एंड विजडम एंड इज़ द बेस ऑफ ह्यूमन लाइफ ए वेरी गुड इवनिंग एंड वॉम वेलकम एस्टीम चीफ गेस्ट एंड स्पीकर ऑफ द डे प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद मेंबर नीति आयोग गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया ऑनरेबल चेयरमैन आई सी एस एस आर प्रोफेसर जे के बजाज रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर वी के मल्होत्रा मेंबर सेक्रेटरी आई सी एस एस आर एमिनेंट सोशल साइंटिस्ट प्रजेंट इन दॉल एंड माई डियर कोलीग्स इट इज़ अ मैटर ऑफ ग्रेट प्राइड एंड प्रिवलेज टू वेलकम यू ऑल इन दर्ड लेक्चर ऑफ आई सी एस एस आर आज़ादी का अमृत महोत्सव लेक्चर सीरीज बींग डिलीवर्ड बाई प्रोफेसर रमेश चंद ऑन द स्टोरी ऑफ इंडियन एग्रीकल्चर इन द सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ इंडिपेंडेंस एंड द प्लान्स फॉर द अमृत काल एज पार्ट ऑफ द सेलिब्रेशन of 75th year of indian independence icssr has initiated a series of lectures to review the achievements of india and the prospects for the future in various fields of social economic scientific and technological endeavor by the leaders in their respective fields this is the third lecture in the series i would now request professor ramesh chand and professor jk bajaj to grace the dais with their presence please welcome thank you sir moving ahead i would now request the honorable chairman dr bajaj to give floral welcome to today's speaker professor ramesh chand thank you sir may i now have the pleasure of inviting professor v k malhotra member secretary icssr to deliver the welcome address and to briefly introduce professor ramesh chand professor j k bajaj chairman indian council of social science research and professor ramesh chand ji uh, member niti ayog uh, we have been in fact uh, doing some work for the fraternity of economics for quite a few years now and uh, professor ramesh chan apart from being a personal friend definitely is a guiding force of indian economic association where we have been closely working also uh, i extend on this evening because right since beginning when professor bajaj discussed with me this idea of having lecture series Uh, in the context of 75 years of india's independence uh, we did think that there has to be a lecture on indian agriculture also and uh, we did not find anybody perhaps more suitable than professor ramesh chand who has been uh, writing his concerns about indian agriculture uh, has definitely contributed in lot many policy documents uh, i think on number of occasions we have discussed apart from the issue of food security the issue ahead of food security which is the nutritional security i i think it would be very prudent to listen all those details from him only and this fine evening so Uh, commemoration of 75 years of india's independence azadi ka amrit mahotsav is the is the moment of great pride joy and honor agriculture is one among us the few sectors that made progressive growth after independence and matched well with the needs of the country success in agriculture since independence has been the backbone of india's success the successful transformational narration of independent india 
therefore, is incomplete without narration of the agricultural transformation from ship to mouth to self-sufficiency and surplus for export. The agriculture imperative and achievements of India have been appreciated globally. Agriculture is the foundation of the civilization, culture and heritage of India. Agriculture in India is a complex mosaic of distinct agro-ecosystems differentiated by climatic, soil, vegetation and other natural features. About half of the Indians derive their livelihood from agriculture and allied activities. It is one of the oldest systems of the world characterized by its diversity and heterogeneity, unorganized and stressed on account of natural and anthropogenic vagaries from seed to market. Historically, stressed natural sources due to unfavorable weather, monsoon and natural calamities has on number of occasions resulted in crop failures leading to food shortages that made serious impacts on the civilization. Post-independence, the Indian agriculture transformed from a food scarce to food exporting country primarily due to science-led or technology-led innovations that caused multifold increase in agricultural production. In spite of increasing abiotic and biotic stresses and depleting along with the deteriorating natural resources. However, among the few sectors that make progressive, that made impressive progress during the last 75 years of India's independence, agriculture is confidently the one. This has been proven time and again. When all the sectors fall short, agriculture comes as a savior. The recent performance during global pandemic COVID-19 is the best example in this light. A few words about Professor Ramesh Chan. In fact, when he delivers his lecture this evening, uh, we would have his full introduction through his words only. Professor Ramesh Chan is currently member Niti Aayog in the rank and status of a union minister of his state. He has a PhD in agriculture economics from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and Indian Society of Agricultural Economics. He has been involved in policy formulation for agricultural sector for past two and a half decades. Prior to joining Niti Ayo, he was director, National Institute of Agriculture Economics and Policy Research, New Delhi. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of International Maize and Wheat Improvement Centre, Mexico, Policy Advisory Council of the Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research, Australia. Professor Chen has authored seven books and published more than 150 research papers in reputed national and international journals in different areas of agriculture, such as production, growth, development policy, farmers' issue, markets and trade. And on this occasion, apart from his specialization in agriculture and food and nutrition security. I would like to place it on record that last time in Indian Economic Association's conference, when we had a session on data deficiency in Indian economy, uh, I remember it did appear to the entire audience that perhaps his proficiency and expertise in areas of def data deficiency in India is perhaps as good as that in agriculture. With these words, uh, I welcome you all, and especially Professor Meshan, who would be delivering this lecture on the story of Indian agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for setting the right tone for today's lecture. It's time to begin with the most awaited part of today's session, that is third lecture on ICSSR's Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav lecture series, by Professor Ramesh Chand, member Niti Aayog. We are really honored to have you, sir. I'm sure all are extremely eager to get enlightened with your words of wisdom. May I now request you, sir, to take over and please deliver the lecture. Uh, Professor uh, Bajaj, Chairperson, Indian Council of Social Sciences Research, uh, Dr. Malhotra ji, Member Secretary, Indian Council of Social Sciences uh, Research, distinguished participants in today's lecture, uh, social scientists, uh, guests, uh, my colleagues from uh, Niti Aayog, 
uh, and uh, I hope there are some students also. I was just uh, mentioning to Dr. Bajaz that uh, I have been a personal beneficiary of uh, ICSSR. It was way back in 1986 that uh, I got a publication grant from ICSSR of rupees 10,000 in 86 to publish my PhD thesis <laughs> from uh, concept publishers. So uh, really, uh, I feel that uh, today is the occasion when I can formally express my uh, gratitude to ICSSR for that uh, financial support, which has uh, played an uh, important role in my uh, professional, professional career, because to have a book uh, published uh, uh, at that uh, young age, uh, at that time was considered uh, creditable. I also want to congratulate uh, ICSSR for starting this uh, lecture uh, series. I think by doing so, Indian Council of Social Science Research is uh, contributing to the vision of our Prime Minister. Uh, as uh, he has uh, already uh, uh, conceptualized these things, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsev and next 25 years as uh, Amrit Kal, just to channelize energy of the country in right uh, direction. So I also feel that uh, we are at a very critical juncture of uh, history. 75 years are uh, quite uh, a long and important uh, milestone in the life of uh, any nation. And uh, as we move uh, toward uh, century, I think it is uh, very important that we take a pause, we reflect on uh, what are our achievements, where we have excelled, where we have not done so well, but have been our strength, but have been our uh, shortcomings, and then use those to plan our future. As we all know that Bibishya ka janam atit ki kok se hota hai, so if we have to plan for future, we must know uh, how we have uh, performed uh, in the past. So this title is not uh, my uh, creation. This title was uh, suggested to me uh, by uh, Indian Council of uh, Social Sciences Research. Uh, maybe after discussion um, um, among <laughs> Professor Bajaj and uh, Dr. Malhotra ji. But uh, Bajaj sahab, I really liked uh, the topic. It uh, helped me in updating uh, most of my work, which I did on Indian agriculture during last uh, 30, uh, 40 years, and uh, have a fresh uh, look at it. Next. Since I have only 40 minutes, uh, I will just uh, show to you uh, what kind of evidence uh, I have uh, prepared to look at uh, uh, our uh, 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 experience of next, uh, our experience of uh, last uh, 75 uh, years. Uh, due to paucity of time, I will not be uh, able to elaborate uh, many of the episodes, but I have just written on the side what is the main message that uh, follows from whatever evidence is uh, presented before you. Next. Next. First, I have only 40 minutes. Ah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, table uh, uh, summarizes our entire story of growth of last uh, 75 uh, years of uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, as you will just see that one is the simple number which just tell you where we were in 551 and where we reached in 2021, right from population that our population increased 3.8 times. We were just uh, 35 crore and now we are close to 137 crores. How growth in food happened during that time? How growth in economy happened during that time? How workers, total workers changed and how uh, agriculture workers changed during uh, that time? So this is just to have overall sense of uh, how uh, much total uh, distance we have uh, traveled during the last uh, uh, 75 years are to be precise between 51 and uh, uh, 2021 uh, during the uh, 70 years uh, period. 
but is important to uh, point out is that uh, this journey was not uh, smooth as it uh, looks from that increase in the food output by nine times so you just see that there were uh, cyclical periods so in economics we have a method to divide uh, overall growth path in different uh, different phases but we call structural breaks uh, i hope you understand this jargon of uh, economics i will avoid to the extent possible given the uh, profile of uh, participants so we call it uh, the method through which you determine structural breaks so when i used this entire data the econometric model told me that in indian economy there were total six breaks as a result of which you find that there were seven phases of agriculture growth first phases that first 10 years after uh, uh, starting our first five year plan in year 1950 51 and during that period you just see that we had a growth rate which was close to 3% then there was deceleration acceleration deceleration acceleration but but is quite uh, uh, important in this uh, overall journey of 70 years is that you just find that both the <laughs> peaks as well as trough they bent up okay so growth remained cyclical these are 10 years growth rates so uh, uh, growth rate are very ticklish that if you don't make proper uh, method in estimating growth rate you can prove it anyway so to avoid any bias what i do is that i start uh, taking growth rate of 10 years average annual rate of change of 10 years and then i calculate its moving average so that all possible growth rate in the successive 10 year are presented in a series and you can interpret according to your own choice so this is uh, but uh, we have found that uh, that uh, no doubt there were uh, uh, cyclical movements but both the peak as well as troughs they just uh, they just uh, bent up and period of acceleration were much longer than what were the period of deceleration so that has been the kind of uh, journey we had in agriculture next so if we look at uh, what kind of growth in different uh, periods so first 10 years we had this close to 3% growth rates in that time this kind of growth rate immediately after independence was possible because agriculture was badly organized before independence so after independence a lot of area which was earlier uh, not under cultivation uh, we brought that under cultivation and area was the main source of growth at uh, that time but we didn't have uh, technology so since we didn't have technology that area source of growth got exhausted very soon and after that you just find that we have a period about uh, 62 to 67 which was a period of uh, great crisis for india in this period our growth rate of uh, food and agriculture was negative and population growth was accelerating because death rate was declining and uh, and uh, because of that the population growth rate uh, uh, accelerated so per capita food availability witnessed a serious beating during those 4 uh, 5 years some of you if uh, you remember that situation was so bad that the then prime minister of country had to give a call to the nation to observe fast at least once a week so i was in school in class 4 at that time so i also observed a fast once a week because food was not available we used to wait for american ship to bring beet for us then that will reach the villages and then we will eat that beet that was the kind of situation but then we adopted green revolution which immediately changed the story that uh, that we went from minus 0.57 to plus uh, 3.55% uh, growth rate and that to only from a very limited area northwest india and delta ek region of the uh, south so that is the power of the technology that technology can change things in a miraculous way and very quickly so that uh, power we harnessed with the first phase of uh, green revolution 
but then that technology was not spreading to other area it remained confined only to uh, irrigated and well endowed region as a result of which the growth rate again fell down to 1.66% so then big thrust given to expand green revolution technology to other area big thrust given to uh, irrigation shallow to well started appearing at uh, that time so beside irrigation groundwater became important source of irrigation for uh, indian uh, agriculture so that pushed growth rate from 1.66 to 4% but then uh, 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 around uh, you know 1995 uh there was wto and india also is a signatory to the wto indian agriculture was exposed to uh, a competition for which we were not fully prepared so because of that you just find that we have again uh, some period 7 8 years when the growth rate uh, slowed down but indian agriculture has its uh, inherent uh, strength uh very soon we just uh, developed our own strength and we proved all those people wrong who just said that because of signing wto we have signed our death warrant uh, indian agriculture is going to uh, totally uh, reun american farmer has holding of 1000 hectare we have average holding of 1.5 hectare how we will compare so all those kind of theoretical <laughs> uh, 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 prophecy they were pro- proved uh, wrong by our uh, uh, strong uh, farmer hard working farmer uh, policy maker and r&d system so you just find that after that decade again we have reached a growth rate uh, of uh, 4% for which we had a target during 11th five year plan that we want to achieve growth rate of 4% but if you look at the last 10 years we have really achieved the growth rate of uh, 4%, 4% so this is the overall story that there are seven phases of uh, india's uh, journey in uh, agriculture but uh, overall our performance has been improving improving and only improving next there are so many other uh, desirable aspect of this growth that initially when we adopted uh, green revolution uh, technology uh those uh, varieties uh, no doubt they were high yielding but uh, it takes time for any new technology for its adaptation for people to adapt that technology so during initial 10 years the instability in overall uh, production uh, just uh, uh, increased previous slide but uh, after some time you just find that uh, 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 in the beginning of 1980 Indian agriculture started becoming more and more and more stable. There are so many ways to look at it. Another way is that uh, you can look at uh, what were the years with negative growth of agriculture in a period of 15 years. So if you look at that by dividing entire period of uh, 75 years, you just find that the frequency of Indian agriculture having negative growth over time especially after 80 declined that initially every alternate year there used to be negative growth then from 5 it fell down to 4 then 4 to 3 then 3 to 2 and last 10 year it was only once uh, in 15 16 that growth rate of agriculture was slightly negative otherwise we have all uh, positive kind of uh, growth rate as uh, professor malhotra has mentioned that even during covid when rest of the economy showed such a big negative growth rate the growth rate of agriculture was higher than what it was the during the year before covid so that kind of resilience in uh, agriculture uh, is uh, there next uh <coughs> uh much of the interest in agriculture you know is because we want food we want food and nutrition security there are other goals also but this is the primary goal that uh, we have interest in agriculture for our survival for our nourishment for our health so food security so if you look at achievement in food production again you will just find that on per capita basis our food production increased at a very impressive rate during the 50 years from 1950 to 2000 we were able to increase per capita production of food by 50% after that it took only 25 years to increase the per capita food production by 50% 
so to have the same achievement we are shortening the period so that is the kind of achievement in agriculture and i am sure optimistic that uh, next 50% increase in per capita food production will happen in about 15 or 18 years that is the kind of forecast uh, i have about uh, about uh, uh, about uh, uh, agriculture and this could happen because population growth started decelerating agriculture growth uh, uh, accelerated as we have seen to uh, 4% so that is what helped us in increasing per capita food production so fast and if we look at the present level of per capita food production and where we were in 1947 now we are producing almost double now we are producing 2 kg food per person per day whereas we were producing only 1 kg food per person per day in 1947 so that is the kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, growth we have uh, seen uh, in case of uh, food production next secondly if we look at composition of food again you find that uh, its uh, composition uh, of food uh, turned uh, very healthy uh that is evident from the fact that uh, more nutritious food fruit vegetable you just find and and livestock uh, eggs milk that their share in the total production was increasing and between 81 and 20 to one that share doubled both of horticulture as well as livestock so again i would say uh, a great uh, achievement that in 30 years we are able to uh, able to raise the share of better uh, nutrition food not only staple many people have this impression as if green revolution means only rice and wheat in fact i will show you the subsequent slide now the lowest growth in different segment of agriculture is in cereal in all other segment now the growth rate is much higher so india did not achieve through technology and its policy only the green revolution we achieved but some agriculture scientists called rainbow revolution there was yellow revolution in oil seeds there was uh, uh, white revolution in milk uh, egg revolution so that is what uh, uh, is uh, evident if you just uh, look at what is the per capita production of uh, different uh, uh, different uh, uh, commodities like you just see in case of cereal the increase is very small but in other cases you just find the increase is much higher but still you will find that even though increase in cereal was not very high india has become biggest exporter of rice and in case of edible oils oil seeds though increase is much larger than what is the increase in cereal but india is again world's biggest importer of edible oil the reason is in our dietary composition per capita intake of cereal is stagnant it is not increasing people are eating less and less chapatis less and less less rice whereas when it comes to oils during last 25 years per capita intake of oil has almost increased three times from little less than 7 kg we are now consuming more than 20 kg oils so you can imagine that health implication and <laughs> all those things so <clears throat> that is the kind of change we had uh, uh, in our uh, in our uh, diets so next uh, uh, in fact uh, production is one aspect but whatever is produced may not uh, be reflected in consumption uh, a country may export a country may use it as a feed for livestock so then there are other ways to look at it uh, ideally it is the consumption survey but since we don't have any consumption survey after 11 12 so i just uh, took the net uh, availability for some commodity where it is available and uh, in other cases i just took per capita production because there i don't have information about uh, what is the industrial use what is the waste is uh, etc the message from this is that uh, increase is in cereal output not leading to increase in intake of uh, cereals then there is no increase in intake of cars yesterday also i was discussing with our member uh, health dr pal he said car itna khate hain to sugar to badhega hi i told him actually there is no increase in intake of cars if you look at cereals cereal intake per capita is just 167 to 168 kg if i take 3 years average you will find that there is no significant difference over time 
so it is not that we are increasing uh, intake of uh, carbs but there are other reasons that uh, that uh, while intake of carb is almost same we are not able to increase the the many other uh, uh, element like protein other nutrients uh, vitamins uh, minerals those kind of things and also some other things that uh, even by uh, eating uh, same amount of cereals uh, our uh, expending of energy is much less than but it used to be earlier that is the reason that if you look at 20 years back people used to eat much more carbs than what they are eating now but the incidence of sugar was much less 25 years back than it is now because at that time physical activity was so strong even many people in delhi would prefer to walk to their house if it was only 4 5 kilometers but now even from um, here to krishi bhavan we will look for auto or rickshaw or our car so that is how lifestyle changes uh, those are the things which are uh, contributing so health aspect is very very important uh, again if we look at overall broad change in our food so our food intake is turning oily and sugary so i i have already given you figure even sugar you just see per capita increase from 14 to 19 whereas it was 7 in 71 now it is more than uh, two times of uh, that whereas increase in case of cereal is not even 7 8% then next so these were achievement in case of uh, food production let us look at uh, the the outcome whatever is the progress in food production i call it that is the output whatever is the effect on health that is the outcome outcome is very very important output is not the ultimate output is a mean to achieve something at that something is that we should have good health we should have good nutrition for that so let us uh, look at uh, what is the status of uh, undernourished uh, population so you just find that after 2001-2 when per capita food production accelerated in a big way the the improvement in nutrition slowed down many people are trying to explain it so far we have not uh, got any satisfactory explanation for this fao in its report has mentioned this as a indian enigma that india producing so much of food making so much progress in food production but that is not reflected in the health of children stunting is so rampant underweight children so high that every year global hunger report will show india in a very very poor light and that is also reflected in fao uh, statistic so this is uh, something which uh, needs to be uh, proved but i am just giving you some plausible explanation but it need to be deeply proved with the uh, evidence i hope after some time i will have some uh, evidence to prove that one possibility seems to be that there is a big inequality in food intake some people are taking uh, too much of protein too much of uh, everything too much of meat too much of uh, dairy products and some people rather many people they are taking too less so that's why we need to go to individual level and aggregate can be misleading so that could be one possibility that inequality in consumption explains why despite the so much improvement in food production india's nutrition outcome are not that good or don't show that much progress and uh, second is that uh, junk food that okay we are eating cereals but we are not eating uh, cereal in terms of uh, normal chapati we are eating more cereal through samosas through uh, pizzas and through other kind of junk food so if you take a take same kind of food same composition but you prefer it as a junk food rather than a healthy food it is going to have adverse implication for health rather than positive implication that is also a possibility which also seems uh, uh, likely to me but i repeat that this is something which need to be uh, further uh, proved next <laughs> Next is our uh, performance in uh, agriculture uh, trade. Uh, uh, Sometimes the data publication publishing agencies they use different uh, type of uh, definitions. So in agriculture trade also, from 1991 uh, onward they changed the grouping of commodities. So that's why I am presenting two graph, one up to 91 and another from 91 to uh, latest uh, 202021. So as you will just find. 
find that till 1988-89, sometimes our import used to be larger than export, sometimes export used to be larger than imports. So we were sometimes uh, positive net uh, uh, export uh, foreign exchange earner. Sometimes uh, we were shelling out uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, more than what we were earning from uh, agriculture export. But beginning 1991, you just find that our exports have increased the lead over imports. And uh, this last year, we exported worth 50 billion US dollars. I think import were around only 18 billion dollars. And this is uh, figure shows that export and import as a percent of value of agriculture output. So, so you just find and that, that uh, India since 1991 has remained as a, uh, agriculture has remained as a net foreign exchange contributor for India. So, uh, 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 this uh, uh, also has another implication that when your uh, trade to GDP ratio exceed 10%, then economists tell us that we can say that our economy is integrated with the international market, that we can't insulate our prices from what happen in international market. If there's a global inflation, it will be transmitted to India. If there's a global uh, crashing of prices, that will also be uh, passed on to India. So that kind of thing has also uh, started uh, happening. Uh, next, uh, I will just uh, give you. Isko uh, Next, next, next. Pe uh, yeah, there is a message in uh, this uh, slide that despite so much progress in agriculture, the progress in non-agriculture was much higher. That is usually the case. That non-agriculture growth is always higher than agriculture growth rate, but. That may not be bad in terms of disparity if agriculture is growing 3%, non-agriculture is growing 5% and the denominator which is the worker that if difference is 20%, then 20% worker from agriculture move to non-agriculture and they earn income from non-agriculture and there is the, the, the cake is to be divided among lesser people in case of agriculture. That happened very slowly. Previous slide indicated that because of that, that, that labor shift from agriculture to non-agriculture happening very slowly, there was increase in disparity in per worker income in agriculture and non-agriculture. You just find both at current price and constant price, it increased and it reached up to 4.5 in year 2000-2001 that one worker in non-agriculture was getting as much income as four worker in agriculture. So that kind of a disparity. Last 10 years, because of, I will say, active policies of this government, slogan of focusing on income rather than on production, you just find that uh, this disparity has uh, declined both at constant term and uh, prices at, as well as also in uh, current prices. It matters more in, uh, at current prices when it comes to the uh, income. So it came down and it is now better than what it was even uh, in uh, 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 1991 or subsequently. So, so I, I would say that minimum, uh, minimum uh, uh, disparity. Next. Uh, next was a story of uh, states. Leave it. No time. No time. Next. Next. From this slide, I just want to give uh, some um, uh, example. Uh, because you know that uh, Punjab has uh, served uh, uh, India very well when we were in crisis of food security. So, uh, discussion on agriculture is not complete if uh, Punjab is not brought into story. But uh, now, I think... We are discussing Punjab not in terms of a very healthy story, rather some unhealthy story. That you look at what is the productivity in Punjab, it is not at the top in crop productivity. There are three states which have higher crop productivity, land productivity than Punjab. They are West Bengal, Andhra and Himachal Pradesh. And what is more disturbing is that uh, in Punjab, many economists will argue we have reached such high yield which are highest in case of rice and wheat. Therefore, don't expect us to have high growth rate. We have reached yield plateau. Yes, there is a yield plateau in rice and wheat. But that should not mean yield plateau in crop sectors. That's why you just find that other three states even with higher productivity than Punjab are growing. I have written the message there. 
growing one state is growing even eight times what is the growth rate of uh, punjab agriculture punjab only 0.68 so message is that those states punjab haryana western up who are sticking to only rice wheat not diversifying they feel that we have achieved great productivity in fact others have much higher productivity than them and still growing much faster rate another example of this that uh, madhya pradesh present land productivity is same as of punjab in 1991 but in 1991 punjab agriculture growth rate continuously decelerated from 3% now come down to 0.6% and at that productivity madhya pradesh is now growing at 8% so <laughs> very important message uh, from uh, this graph next next is uh, uh, about uh, subsidy and uh, investment our subsidy has been rising very very uh, rapidly that uh, uh, in fact if you take into account uh, some of the support that is being given by states the total support to agriculture has crossed 15% of income of agriculture sector investment is much less private sector investment are still uh, very very less next chaliye now onward uh, i will only uh, mention uh, messages i get passionate about <laughs> these things but i think i should have some respect for time so if you just see next if you just see next that uh, uh, after this farm agitation withdrawal of farm law again demanding msp msp as a legal status you see what i have tried to demonstrate here wheat and rice where we have msp the growth rate is minimum 1.62 you look at any other segment where there is no msp fruit and vegetable what is the growth rate livestock what is the growth rate fishery what is the growth rate all other segment even in case of oil seed what is the growth rate so there is no guarantee that if you have msp for something it will continue to give you high growth much stronger source of growth is demand so demand driven growth is much stronger than what is the msp driven growth rather we have reached a stage we are artificially sustaining growth rate of wheat growth rate of rice and growth rate of sugar it is not supported by demand side factors so you just find today i was reviewing uh, uh, progress of one ministry ministry of food out of 12 scheme they mentioned 11 are on support to sugar cane only in different forms how they, that is being uh, support is being given so even if you give support of thousands of crores of rupees if demand side factors are not supporting you can't sustain that growth rather it will then create a problem for uh, uh, for for fiscal resources that is coming out uh, evidently and that's why farm laws were uh, brought so that we can harness the the effect of uh, demand side to give big boost to uh, growth rate in our agriculture and growth rate in income of our farmers next chhod uh, dijiye next let's go to part 2 uh, uh, ek minute yeah this is uh, important that now we have uh, completed 75 years where do we stand now agriculture still is the most important sector among the 10 sectors uh, 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 in which economy is divided by cso agriculture remain the most important in terms of contribution to income 45% employment welfare implication all those things uh, this is where we stand now this is the present uh, uh, summarized version of what is contribution of agriculture now quickly move to the second part what is uh, what we are uh, uh, planning for this uh, amrit kal uh, for this as i said learning that 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 uh, in order to uh, plan for next uh, 25 years we should base our thinking on four five things one is what is experience of the past of the country and also of the states secondly what are the challenging what are the opportunities what are the operating environment what are the need and goal of the country which we should uh, keep into mind ab aap inko sab ko chhod ke aage jaiye aage jaiye chalte jaiye chalte jaiye chalte chaliye no time ha yahan rukiye ya ya you see this is the scenario we are going to have that uh, our food grain production uh, is likely 
to grow at 3.5 percent at least in the next uh, 10 years. My basis to say so is that still you find that productivity in eastern states like Odisha, uh, Assam, uh, um, um, part of Bihar is so low compared to if you see the top yielding states that just by having, uh, in fact, uh, there was one advantage of not having green revolution in entire country in one go. That helped us in a smooth growth over a very long period of time. If we had green revolution just in one go, probably we would have felt so much of crash in prices, uh, it would have been detrimental for farmers. So we just spread initially better endured regions than uh, to some region. And then we have this bringing green revolution to Eastern India, BG REI. So that is providing us uh, growth in that region. So next 10, 15 years, we have enough area where we can take modern technology and we can have this kind of growth rate. But population growth rate is uh, decelerating. So as a result of that, you will just find that, that uh, India would need to find market for its growth in output. And I have written at several places in newspaper also that in coming year, India will be required to export one third of its growth in agriculture. We have to find overseas market for that. And for that, we will require efficiency, we will require competition, we will require value chain. So we have to base our, uh, our uh, thinking on uh, all these things uh, and then uh, plan for the future. Our last two slides, pe chaliye, reimagining agriculture. Next, next, pe chaliye, no time. Bajaj sahab told me that uh, they plan to publish this lecture, so maybe these things will be <laughs> put there and if some of you is interested, they can uh, see there. So given all this uh, situation of uh, demand uh, and uh, other kind of things, fiscal burden of subsidies, we need to uh, reimagine agriculture. So when we are talking of uh, reimagining agriculture, what are uh, 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 almost uh, uh, a dozen or 15 things which we need to keep in uh, mind? One is that uh, during the time of uh, shortage, it was justified that uh, we have obsession with growth. But no more. Now our population growth next 20 years will be less than 0.8%. It is not 2.3% of 60s and 70s. Therefore, we have to plan uh, differently. We are now in a situation of surplus. We have to plan for surplus management rather than shortage management. So we need to have goals, growth plus, 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 plus. So what are those pluses? In those pluses, we have uh, sustainability. In those pluses, we have uh, efficiency. In those pluses, we have emphasis on farmer income. In those pluses, we also have ensuring judicious use of agrochemical, judicious use of uh, uh, our natural resources. In fact, I have one slide, complete uh, slide. I will share it with my colleague Nirmal uh, Patel, who is uh, Neelam Patel, uh, who is a strong uh, supporter of natural farming. So there I gave uh, some argument why we need to do it and how we can do it and how we should be uh, doing it. So that uh, aspect also need to be brought into account that now people are worried about health, people are worried about food safety, people are worried about having less agrochemical residue on their food. So those are the meaning of uh, meaning of uh, uh, plus 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 plus. Next, and uh, 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 all said and done, this last uh, bullet is uh, very very uh, uh, important. Effective plan to promote and sustain part-time farmers. Many people say that over time, people move out of agriculture, see the experience of Western country, uh, big fish eat small fish. Uh, in Europe, it has happened like this. So ultimately, scale advantage uh, will force small farmer to leave agriculture. That is a Western model. Since most of our economists and agriculture scientists, they got their degrees and postdoctoral fellowship in Western country, say though they are not well versed with what is the Asian experience. Asian experience is totally different than Western experience. Whether it is Japan, whether it is recently China, Korea, any Asian country, you just find that small farmer have not gone from there. Even Japan, where capitalist development is as high as in case of USA, you just find that there are smallholders 
and farm size is less than half of what it is in india so small farmer are going to stay in case of uh, uh, india we have to see that uh, that uh, uh, small farmer are there but small farm may not give them decent income so how we deal with it the answer to that is that ultimately in the amrit kal we will be required to plan for part time farmers that somebody does farming on holidays after uh, work hours before work hours but that income will not be enough so we have to find that we give them some other uh, sources of income some other sources of uh, employment the last thing is that why world is now looking at uh, agriculture there are many reason but this is most important reason that is employment the industry 4.0 even the industry 5.0 which will follow industry 4.0 is turning more and more capital intensive more and more artificial intelligence all those things people talk about agriculture but poor agriculture is not able to use artificial intelligence blockchain traceability nothing like that but industry is using because it is economical and that is labor displacing very much labor displacing so we have to find jobs so for that it looks like we have to look back at agriculture and as some people imagine that ultimately we have to use farm as a factory then it will serve all need of humanity so i wish that during amrit kal we will move in that direction and we will show to the world that this is how we can go ahead in the future thank you very much sorry bajaj sir i took extra time it was extremely insightful and thought provoking session i think you deserve a big round of applause <laughs> moving ahead i would now request dr bajaj to give concluding remarks for today's lecture ramesh chand uh, profusely let me thank him because he has given us a, a very brief very compact but uh, very vast overview of indian agriculture uh, from independence till today and how it is going to be in the amrit kala as our prime minister has defined the next 25 years of independence uh, uh, he has said various things uh, but agriculture is a very multi dimensional field and uh, as he was showing various slides i felt that on every slide we need a longer bhasha then he has been able to give us in this brief time uh, i expect that uh, you will give us a longer written note to be published because i have also skipped many things but not only that we need a longer note from him i will tell i uh, will tell to our member secretary that maybe we should consider having a two day conference in the icssr on this particular issue whenever uh, he can spare some time we should call uh, a few or many uh, economists and let's have a uh, two, two day conference on the issues concerning agriculture uh in the, the, the i have one need to comment on want to comment on many things but this small farmer part time farmer issue Uh, one is that uh, my feeling is that in india many farmers have become part time farmers not in the sense that spend part of their time on the farm but uh, i went to various uh, uh, farming households in vidarbha uh, and they are telling me that they are able to survive on the farm because they are keeping at least one of member of their family employed outside the farm he he could be a jcb driver he could be a cook somewhere that one member being outside could sustain the farm and if no member is outside it could not be sustained and he was as i was saying the asian experience is different the japanese farms will be very small much smaller than and uh, one side an opportunity to go through some parts of japan and uh, one is of course their farms are like gardens actually uh, it it used to be said about indian farms at the time on term fayan when sang that the 
Indian uh, agriculture fields are actually do not look like fields. They look like uh, they look like gardens. Uh, Japanese look like that. They they take care of every inch of every inch is tended. But perhaps since you are learning, maybe you would have noticed that many many more most of the people on the farm are women. Men are in Tokyo and they are in Kyoto, women are taking So that is the part time. Uh, so maybe something of like that will happen here. Uh, uh, agriculture is a very dear subject to me. And uh, you'll uh, excuse me if I take uh, about 10 minutes, five, seven minutes more. He has been generous in being very fast in his presentation. So I'll take about seven, eight minutes. In fact, when I decided to shift from physics to uh, social sciences, I went to IIT Kanpur, uh, not Kanpur, Mumbai, in the humanities department. I went to the philosophy department, but the first work I did was on agriculture, agricultural economics. Uh, I, uh, the kind of slides he was showing in the beginning. In fact, I uh, went to, I remember having spent months in Kalina Library, uh, that was one library where we had this uh, handbook of statistics from 1940s onwards, actually, even later. And I compiled that data uh, from the uh, time of independence to, that was, I think, 1990 when I was doing this. And uh, I drew all these uh, initial graphs that what period, what has happened, how much was the growth in the first phase, uh, first plan period, how much of the second plan period, third plan period. Um, the graphs I drew will not agree with what he has drawn because as he told you, these growth rates and graphs depend very much on how you treat them. He is talking about 10 year moving average. I was trying to do three year and five year moving averages of the data. And later, I looked at, there used to be, I don't know, it must be still around, the FAO used to produce an agrostat uh, for the whole world, it used to give data on the production uh, and utilization of uh, agricultural products for every country. And I think I compiled data for about uh, uh, 100, 150 countries from there. Uh, it, and uh, one of the things I noticed at the time, which we all very strongly noticed, was that uh, though we were having agriculture production growth, per capita uh, production of food, uh, and food in our case meant food grains, which means uh, uh, cereals, pulses, and oil seeds. That seemed to continue to hover around 200 kilogram for a very long period, 200 kilogram per capita per year. It was most of the time, most of the time below that. In fact, uh, if I look at this, this is the first time in the last uh, five, seven years that we have seemed to have broken that barrier. His data is showing that 21 is some, your numbers seem to be showing something like 250 kg, which is extraordinary from the data that I was seeing at that time. And I started worrying, wondering what is this, uh, this con constraint of 200 kg. At the time of independence, it was much worse. It was more like 150, because the most uh, fertile lands of India the western Pakistan was very fertile because all the new uh, irrigation had been opened in western. And uh, eastern Pakistan is very fertile even today because that is the alluvial land of, of uh, uh, Padma and Ganga and whatever. Uh, so when at the time of the situation was bad, per capita production was far below 200. But uh, we improved in the first uh, first plan period. So what I was saying is this 200 kg number, uh, I, uh, re I read that 1880 Famine Commission had put this number of 200 kg as the critical number that in an area where there is famine prevailing, they said that if you ensure availability of 200 kg 
per capita, there will be no frank deaths in, in that area. So that number has been continuing. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were worried that, uh, as I told you, uh, for very large part of Indian experience, the malnutrition and uh, hunger has been very widespread. And we always felt that this is the 200 kg thing which causes that. And uh, the moment you go start going about above that, both will start reducing the hunger as well as. Uh, and our estimate used to be, and this is, I think, many environmentalists are saying, that you reach around 300 kg, then, then you are safe. Uh, beyond that, you can be called developed. And I always used to say that when we, from 200 kg, we reach above 300 kg, we can start saying that we are, we are in the uh, development. Now we are, can call ourselves a developed country. Uh, we seem to be moving in that direction now. He just said that uh, uh, he expects the next doubling. That in the 90s, we talked a great deal that let us double production in the next 10 years. It didn't happen. But uh, now the doubling is happening. And doubling of per capita is happening partly because, as he told you, our uh, gross growth rate of population has come down from something like 2.3, 2.5, it used to be in the 60s and 70s, to, uh, I think, it's less than one now. And perhaps it'd be much less. And if you look at the TFRs, we are actually, uh, in another perhaps 20 years, we'll maybe be entering the negative growth phase also. So finally, India is uh, moving towards, uh, agriculture is moving in that direction that in 10 years, maybe from the kind of uh, 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 parameters we had fixed, we can start calling ourselves a developed country. Uh, if it had happened 20 years ago, it would have been much better. We, we were talking about it, and we thought that the economists are not very responsive. We went and talked to the planning commission. And then we wrote a book. Uh, looking at what uh, India has thought about uh, food and hunger in its tradition. Uh, we wrote a book called, uh, and I, that remains one of our best books, Annam Bahu Kurvita Tadvratam. Tadvratam is the, it's a, it's a Upanishadic saying, Annam Bahu Kurvita Tadvratam. Uh, ensure a plenty of food. This is inviolable discipline of mankind. Uh, and we gave uh, uh, excerpts from the Itihasas, from the Puranas, from the, from the uh, uh, Vedas, and from the Upanishads to show that. That book, I believe, had some impact. We also had a uh, seminar in involving not the economists, but the Politicians of that time, I think this is 91, Atal Bihari Vajpayee was there, Advani ji was there, Chandra Shaikh was there, Pranav Mukherjee was there, the whole uh, Chatranan Mishra used to be there. And all of them agreed with this, that we need to very quickly increase per capita production. It is happening only now, it didn't happen earlier. But uh, I think we need to uh, document this experience. You have done it. And uh, we will uh, publish this, but spare some time with us sometime. And we'll have a two-day conference on this so that this experience has been documented in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable and insightful words. I would now request Chairman, sir, to felicitate the chief guest by offering him a token of respect. Thank you, sir. I would now 
request Dr. Ashish Devalia, Administrative Officer, ICSSR, to extend vote of thanks for today's program. Thank you, Nitin. At the end of the event, it's my privilege and duty to extend the vote of thanks. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the speaker of the day, Professor Ramesh Chand, for accepting our request and delivering such an eloquent and thought-provoking lecture. It provided empirical insights, elucidation on the evolution, growth, history, and the future challenges in agriculture in India. The lecture had a perfect blend of vast administrative and academic experience. The fact, ideas, and thoughts expressed by Professor Ramesh Chand provided the complete picture of the growth of agriculture in India in the last 75 years and the future ahead. This all could be possible because of the active participation, cooperation, and guidance of all concerned. A special thanks to our chairman, Dr. J.K. Bajaj, for bringing the idea of starting this lecture series on ground. I am also thankful to Professor V.K. Malhotra, Member Secretary, ICSSR, for his constant support and guidance. I extend my special thanks to all the luminaries and social scientists, our colleagues, our pensioners who are present here for gracing this occasion. We are fortunately backed up by a group of highly motivated and dedicated colleagues from the ICSSR who are, comp who are competent in their assigned jobs and focused on attain attaining results. We really consider, consider ourselves lucky for that. I thank and congratulate the entire team of our ICSSR for putting in untiring efforts to make this lecture series a success. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end of today's program. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for making this a grand success. Thank you, sir.